This is a lecture on parallel architectures for Comp 375 Computer Architecture and Organization at North Carolina A&T State University. Course evaluations are out on Blackboard and they're available until May 4th. Make sure you complete the evaluations for all of your classes. Uh, the administration actually cares a lot about these things. There's a continuing effort to make faster and faster computers. Some programs take more than a laptop to execute. Some of the engineering prior problems to design large bridges or systems require a lot of computing resources. There's only so much you can do to crank up that clock speed. It's just not going to make it work. So a lot of the machines run parallel, have multiple processors to run lots of things at the same time. Remember this diagram from the beginning of the course, where architectural improvements are responsible for most of the performance improvements, not just cranking up the clock. Or remember that when you write a program, it isn't always important that the program is fast. It's good to write an uh, efficient algorithm, but don't go out of your way to make it fast if it's not going to run for a long period of time. If the program is going to run in a blink of an eye, it's not important that it runs in half a blink of an eye. What's really important is that it's correct. So don't sacrifice correctness for, for speed. Make sure first that the program is correct. Then, if it's actually necessary to be fast, work on speed. If you write a good algorithm, it'll probably be fast. We talked about superscalar processors. They're capable of running multiple instructions at the same time. This is instruction level parallelism where the CPU will fetch two instructions and if they can be executed in parallel it will do so. Here's our diagram where at the top we're showing regular pipelining and at the bottom we're showing pipelining for a superscalar processor that will execute two instructions at the same time if there are no hazards. The instruction level Parallelism allows regular programs that had no thought about being parallel to run in somewhat parallel manner. The Itanium explicitly specifies which instructions can be run at the same time. The Itanium has instruction bundles of three instructions, all of which can be executed in parallel on three separate processors, and none of which have any hazards. The Intel systems uh, introduced hyperthreading uh, a few years ago. Hyperthreading allows the processor, a single CPU or single core, to alternate programs or alternate threads. In other words, in one instruction will be from one program, and the next instruction will be from a different program. Then we go back to the first program, and then the second program, first and second, and so forth, back and forth. Uh, in this way, it looks like you have two processors when in fact you only have one and that allows two programs to execute at the same time. Of course each program runs at half the speed so you're not actually making it run particularly fast you're just allowing it to have two processors. So if you have two programs running they can both run at the same time. There is an advantage of pipelining because none of the uh, instructions in program A will have any data hazards with the programs B. So uh, it does run a, a little bit faster for pipelining. On the other hand, if you don't have lots running, it's probably an advantage to just leave off the hyperthreading and run it all as one processor. Hyperthreading was cool until every laptop has two or four cores. Now you have sufficient processors with multi core machines that it's best to turn off hyperthreading. The answer is B. The compiler is required to make effective use of superscalar processes, but the programmer in the operating system don't have to do anything at all. Again, the Itanium bundles instructions in groups of three instructions, all of which are hazard free, and so it can execute three instructions simultaneously. The Itanium concept 
is that the CPU does not have to discover parallelism, that the compiler will tell it which instructions are in parallel. There are multiple ways to make a machine parallel, some of which is macro parallelism that the programmer will see, and some of it is micro parallelism that the programmer does not see. Uh, we've mentioned superscale execution, uh, hyperthreading. Some machines have multiple ALUs. A lot of machines these days have dual core, that is, multiple processes on a single chip. Almost all operating systems support multiple processes and multiple threads. A process each has its own memory space. Threads, on the other hand, share the memory space of a process. So a process can have multiple threads. It will always have at least one thread. The answer is B, the compiler. The compiler bundles the instructions into packets of three. The programmer, high-level language, doesn't have to do anything. And the CPU, the hardware, relies on the compiler to figure out what can be run in parallel instead of the old Intel x86 system where the processor tried to discover parallelism. OK, we've got different parallel operations. Uh, and some of them are visible to the programmer and some are not. For instance, superscalar execution uh, is invisible to the uh, pro programmer and in some sense invisible to the compiler, although the compiler can be more efficient if it arranges the code for superscalar execution. Multiple threads require the programmer to take explicit action. You might have to create a program with multiple threads in order to efficiently use multiple processors. And of course, you can have different programmers running at the same time. A programmer, when he writes the code, doesn't worry at all about what other programmers might be running at the same time. Flynn's parallel classification is a classical way of identifying different types of parallel computers. While if we were to make a classification system today, it'd probably be a little bit different. But the wording and knowledge of Flynn's system is so built into computer science that every computer science student should know the four different classifications of parallel systems. They're classified by how many instructions are executed simultaneously and how much data is simultaneous. The simplest system, single instruction, single data, is uh, used by old-fashioned uniprocessor systems. Our microcode computer was an SISD machine. Single instruction multiple data is where each instruction acts on multiple pieces of data at the same time. And there are array processors that do this. Multiple instruction single data are systolic processors, and they're not used very much at all. Multiple instruction multiple data is the most common type of parallel computer. You can further define MIMD machines into shared memory and separate memory. In a shared memory system, all the processors see the same memory, and they can all access the same memory. Uh, SMP are shared memory multiprocessors, uh, and they are like multi-core systems. Your laptop is an SMP shared memory system, where each processor, each core can see the whole memory. NUMA is non-uniform memory access. Now, in contrast to shared memory, there are separate memory systems, systems that are built of processors and memory where each processor has its own memory and they communicate by sending messages between the systems. A single instruction, single data, or SISD, is the simplest system. It's not at all parallel. Each instruction acts on one pair of operands. For instance, add EAX comma dog, even though there are two operands there, it's one single operation on a data pair. The answer is D, MIMD. Most laptops these days have multiple cores and therefore run with multiple instructions and multiple data.
Maybe you have a fancier laptop than I do. Phones and laptops are generally MIMD. Single instruction multiple data or SIMD systems uh, have a single instruction that acts on a large set of data or a, usually a vector or matrix of information. So they can run a lot of parallel operations, the same operation on many different pieces of data at the same time. The Intel i5, i7s have a series of instructions called the MMX or Multimedia Extensions and they perform uh, SIMD operations as they pick up eight one-byte integers and act on them in parallel. There are vector processors out there that will do arithmetic on a one-dimensional array all at once. In other words, there's a single instruction that says, take this vector and this other vector and add them together all at once. Uh, some machines often have 64 doubles and you can have a register, imagine, a machine register that actually has 64 doubles in it. You can load 64 doubles from RAM and to one register and into another register and then add them or subtract them together. For example, consider the C uh, code here where we are adding uh, two, register, two 64 byte uh, arrays to get another 64 byte array. And on the top, it gives an idea of doing it with a traditional machine. On the bottom, you just do a vector add of all the A and the B together to get C. Now, not every array is going to be sequential memory locations because sometimes you have uh, two-dimensional arrays and why the columns might be vectors, the rows might be separated. Uh, and you can think of them as being a stride. That is how many bytes between each particular element in the array. So look at this here, where we're going to multiply uh, the A matrix by the B matrix using classical uh, array multiplication that you learned uh, in your math classes. The uh, A register, or the A array, is an order. In other words, A1 follows A1, it's followed by A12, it's followed by A13, and A21, and so forth. But the B registers, the uh, B11, B21, B31, are not next to each other. And because if you remember with array multiplication, it's going to be A11 times B11 plus A12 times B21 plus A13 times B31. Well, it's going to have to access the B array with every other one. So that's like a stride of two in that each data element in the B is two apart, whereas the A array is at a stride of one. Each element is one right after another. There were some early vector processors. The Cray computer made a bunch of supercomputers. The Cray 1, the first real supercomputer, uh, was sold to Los Alamos National Lab uh, for $8.8 .8 million, which in today's uh, dollars is about $37 million. So it was kind of expensive, although if you look at some of the numbers it has, they seem so very small compared to today's computers. And in fact, uh, your laptop is probably much faster than the Cray-1 processor. Uh, it was a single instruction, multiple data machine, uh, 80 megahertz clock, which of course seems incredibly slow now, but that was fast then. Uh, did 160 million floating point operations a section. Uh, had eight megabytes of memory and was liquid cooled. The lower cooling ring on the outside was padded so you could sit on it. Oh, Dr. Williams has actually sat on a Cray supercomputer. Uh, ten years later, Cray made the Cray 2, uh, which was ten times faster than the Cray 1. Uh, here's a picture of one. It has blue lights and liquid cooled waterfalls. When you're going to spend tens of millions of dollars for a computer, you want it to look like a $10 million computer. The answer is A. SIMD uh, operates on 
multiple data for a single instruction, and the MMX instructions operate on eight bytes at a time, doing the same operation on all eight bytes. I think there is an idea of data flow architecture. Here we're going to compute A plus B times the quantity B minus 4. Well, you can imagine A, B, and the number 4 flowing into uh, simple processors. So the addition processor has A and B input, and output comes the sum, whereas the subtraction processor has B and 4 flowing into it, and out comes B minus 4, and they flow into a, another processor, which multiplies the result. And you can imagine continual values of A, B, and of course 4 flowing into this machine, so it continues to execute the A plus B times the quantity B minus 4. This is the idea behind systolic architectures, or multiple instruction, single data, where the machine picks up a piece of data and then runs it through multiple processors to do multiple different instructions on that data. Systolic architectures are generally used for special purpose processors. Uh, they were very limited to what they could do, have very simple communications between their cells. They can be very fast if they execute in the right domain. Here's an example of a two-dimensional array multiplication where you're feeding in the A array from the left in different rows and the B array coming in the columns. So as you can go through, the data is multiplied and added and moved through it until at last after seven time periods, you finally got the whole result moving through each of these processors that do a multiply add. Systolic architectures never caught on. They just didn't work for general purpose computing, and they are only used, and very rarely used, in special highly structured environments where you might have uh, signal processing. Multiple instruction, multiple data, or MIMD process, is the most common type of multiprocessor system. Your laptop is an MIMD. It has multiple cores. In this case, there are multiple processors, each executing independently on different instructions on different data. Generally, most processors can access all of the memory at the same time. There are, of course, specialized processors uh, that run like this. Even in a very simple laptop, the uh, IO controllers have direct memory access. They can run in parallel with the CPU. Your graphics processor does a tremendous amount of processing to display the image on your screen, and it is an independent coprocessor. Uh, in the early Intel 8086, uh, machines before that, floating point wasn't part of the processor, but you could buy a separate floating point chip, which was a separate floating point processor. And a lot of the early machines you could buy vector processors if you need to do vector processing. Laptops are shared memory systems. Now, there are separate memory systems where each processor has its own memory and doesn't have any uh, interference from other processors. If you have lots of processors accessing the same memory, then there's a lot going over the bus. And the bus has got a limited bandwidth. There's only so much data that can go over the bus. So if you have lots of processes connected to lots of memory systems, you can only run so fast because of the bus. Whereas if you have separate memory systems, each processor can access the memory independently. And so it doesn't have to worry about inter interference from other processors. There are many different ways you can connect the different processors and memory systems together. The general goal was to try to minimize the number of connections per CPU, uh, minimize the average distance between nodes. Thinking of each processor as a node, you didn't want to have to go through a lot of different uh, nodes and a long connection to get communicating from one processor to another. And of course, you wanted the whole thing to be simple because you want to do this quickly. One simple way was a grid, where all the processors are laid out in a uh, two-dimensional grid. 
the diameter, which is the longest distance, in this case from the corners, is 2 times the square root of n minus 2. So in this case, there's 16 processors. Uh, square root of n is 4 for 8 minus 2, so it takes 6 to get there. A torus is very similar to a grid, but it wraps around both top and bottom so that you can consider the leftmost processor connected to the rightmost processor in any row and the topmost processor connected to the bottommost processor uh, in any column. This improves the number down to the square root of n. Then there's hypercube systems, which each processor is connected to another processor whose binary number of the uh, node ID differs by one bit. So if you look in this diagram, uh, we have node 100, zero, zero, and it's connected to 110, and it's also connected to 01, and it's connected to 101. Zero, one. So those are the nodes that are its neighbors. Any other node that differs by one bit. In this example, there are eight processors, but generally you have to have powers of two. So it could be eight, 16, uh, I've used machines that had 64,000 processors. Non-uniform memory systems have uh, separate memory, but also share memory. And in that way, in general, it can access its own memory very quickly. But if it wants to access the other systems, it can still do that, although it may be slower and take longer to access memory that's not your local. Here's an example where each processor node has its own cache, its own uh, local memory, but if it needs to, it can access the memory of another node. Please make sure you do the teaching evaluations for all of your classes. Tell them what you think of old Dr. Williams. Honest evaluations are important.